Hey, is I'm going to first tell you who these folks are. Then I'm going to give a few open remarks to help us focus this discussion. And then each of the panelists will have five to ten minutes to give some opening remarks and viewing uh, their views of the issue of the role of mind, body, healing, and wellness in American health policy. And then we will open the rest of the session up for uh, discussion and questions. And what I would like to do, my preference is to have you talk to us as opposed to us just talking to each other. And so I hope that as the, the panelists are speaking, you'll be either taking some notes or just noting to yourself something interesting, provocative that they said, something you would like to comment on or ask. And I'm hoping that we can, again, at, toward the end, have more discussion, us with you, than us just talking to each other and you sitting passively and listening. So first of all, uh, who are these people? Uh, to my, this is my, my right, I think. <laughs> I have a lot of left or right confusion at times. This is uh, Dr. Neil Barnard, who's a clinical researcher, author, and health advocate, uh, emphasizing research on the impact of diet on health. He founded in 1985 uh, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine and is also an, ad an adjunct associate professor of medicine at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. To his right is Karen Howard, who is the Executive Director of the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians, the AAMP. Uh, she oversees this large organization uh, and having an impact on its, its mission and its functions. The AAMP is committed to changing the current health healthcare system from one that treats disease to one that promotes health, which um, as an exercise, that makes an awful lot of sense to me. I hope that is going well. Uh, she spent the last, almost the last 25 years working with Congress and legislatures and healthcare providers, organizations to help develop innovative healthcare policy. To her right is Dr. Esther Sternberg, uh, who is an internationally recognized researcher on brain immune interaction and the effects of the brain stress response on health, um, in, in a sense, this, this science of mind body interaction. She got her MD in rheumatology from McGill University in St. Louis uh, before joining the National Institutes of Health here in, in Bethesda, Maryland in 1986. She's written several books on uh, the science of health and emotions, which will be available um, after our presentation. Uh, she also mentioned a minute ago that she will be has a PBS uh, television special on the science of healing coming up, being shown locally on Sunday the 27th, later to be shown nationally in December. We'll be talking more about that a little bit later. And finally, to her right is uh, James S. Turner, who is uh, an attorney uh, and a partner with the Washington, D.C. law firm of Swankin and Turner, formed in 1973. He's also uh, board chair of Citizens for Health, which is a major consumer voice in the natural health community. He began working in the 1960s uh, with Ralph Nader, who I'm sure you've all heard, has written a number of books on health and health policy, has served special counsel to the Senate Select Committee on Food, Nutrition, and Health, and has worked with uh, a number of corporations, including Kraft Foods, Red <coughs> Roots, et cetera, in, uh, in helping them develop uh, effective uh, policies and products. Um, to tell, to, to, to say more about the comments will probably take the next half hour, so it's going to leave it at that, and they can tell you probably something about themselves and get open remark. I think that's probably uh, enough for now. So just to give you some idea of what this is all about, the title of this um, symposium or discussion is What is the Role of Mind, Body, Healing, and Wellness in the Reshaping of America's Healthcare Policy? I think that's a pretty big topic which could go anywhere from talking primarily about what to do about health policy to what in the world we mean by mind, body, and what do we mean by healing and wellness. What I'm hoping to have this discussion focus on is the first part of that, because I think that uh, discussing health policy, including questions of who should pay for what, depends largely on the question of what we mean by health and what we mean by health care. I was, I've been a runner for probably about 30 years, and was on the way this morning was doing some calculations about how much money I've spent in the last 30 years on running shoes. I probably buy three pairs of running shoes per year at about $100 a pop. And that's $300 a year times 30, I believe that's around $9,000 on running shoes. 
not counting what I've spent on running shorts and t-shirts and socks, that's just for the shoes. Um, I'm, I've been wondering at uh, this point also, how much money I'm saving my health insurance provider by spending, having spent $9,000 in the last 30 years on running shoes. You know that running exercise is probably one of the best preventive measures possible. My guess is that I am saving, I've been saving, probably will save over the next 30 years, my health insurance company, tens and tens of thousands of dollars. Why are they not reimbursing me for the cost of my running shoes? Well, I think the answer to that question, or, or the cost of your yoga class, or the cost of your Nutrisystem diet, I think the answer is that our society, including other societies, don't consider those activities to be healthcare. That exercise is not viewed as healthcare. That dieting is not viewed as healthcare. That taking yoga lessons is not viewed as healthcare. That playing tennis three times a week is not viewed as healthcare. But it is healthcare because those are the kinds of activities that keep people well and keep people healthy and keep people from getting sick. So why are those not reimbursable activities the way that medication that visits the doctors are? Again, I think the answer is that our culture society defines healthcare as a certain set of behaviors. Those other behaviors are considered healthcare, and therefore they, we pay for them ourselves. And my point is not that Blue Cross Blue Shield should be reimbursing me for my running shoes, but the question arises, why do they not? And, what, and how do we define healthcare in ways that include certain activities and exclude <coughs> certain other activities? I think the focus of today's discussion is what do we mean by healthcare? What is healthcare? And maybe it's time to rethink what healthcare is. And I think that's an overarching question that probably precedes questions such as who's going to pay for what and whose congressional schemes are paying for what is the one that should be endorsed. So what you'll hear from our panel, I believe, is a focus primarily on what do we mean by health care and how should we how could we how should we rethink what the notion of health care means. And with that, uh, I will turn things over to including the microphone to Dr. Barnett. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation to present on this, this part of the panel. Um, I have to confess that although I want to focus on wellness, this it has absolutely nothing to do with my own personal background. I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota. My extended family was all in the cattle business. And um, every day of my life we ate roast beef, baked potatoes, and corn. Except for special occasions when we ate roast beef, baked potatoes, and peas. Uh, my father took a great dislike to the cattle business and uh, left it and went to medical school and spent his life treating diabetes in Fargo, North Dakota. He advised me that when I went to medical school, I should try to tackle some more, uh, some less thankless uh, disease than diabetes. Um, and I'd like to make some remarks about uh, that. Uh, on September 9th, uh, Barack Obama addressed a joint sec uh, session of Congress. And he laid out three broad goals. One was for people who are insured to get the most out of their insurance and to protect their coverage. For those who were uninsured to be able to get insurance. And third was to reduce waste and so to reduce cost. But in that room was a 400 pound gorilla that the president never glanced at and no member of Congress looked at at all. And that is that we are using a phenomenal amount of health care. And the whole debate over how do we cover this is a debate in dollars and cents that is entirely fueled by the fact that as a nation we are not healthy and we are using a phenomenal amount of health care. If we take just diabetes, there are nearly 24 million Americans who have diabetes. There are about 57 million people who have pre-diabetes, meaning that if they don't make some changes in diet and lifestyle, they are headed for the very same diagnosis. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimate that of all the children born since the year 2000, one in three will develop diabetes at some point in their life. Now, the average person with diabetes who comes into my office doesn't bring a bottle of medicine, they bring a sack of medicine. And they roll it out on my desk, and it's, if you add it up, for a typical case, it's between three and $5,000 per year for one person for just their medications. I'm not talking about doctor bills. 
hospital bills, emergency room visits, or medical supplies. Just the bills alone. And as a nation, in the year 2000, which is the most recent year I've got good data for, we spent $174 billion, billion with a B, dollars just for diabetes, just one disease. And if you look at other conditions, there are 74 million Americans who are hypertensive right now. Uh, most of them either are on medications or need it. There are 17 million who have coronary artery disease. They roll into the operating room, they're very expensive. The reason that the president and the members of Congress couldn't look the gorilla in the eye was because our government is causing many of these diseases. Nobody likes to talk about it, nobody likes to admit it, and nobody wants to change it. But between 2003 and 2005, the government spent about $20 billion subsidizing feed grains. I'm talking about corn, soybeans, or sorghum for to feed to cattle, to feed to chickens, to feed to pigs. All of which then put cholesterol on our plate and a lot of excess uh, saturated fat and calories on our plate. Uh, during that same interval, the government spent $1.3 billion subsidizing the dairy industry. Dairy products are the number one source of saturated fat in children's diets. And in July of this year, uh, Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack said he was going to spend another $243 million to help bail out the dairy industry because their profits had fallen. He wanted to prop them up. And what they do is they buy up cheese and non-fat dry milk and other products. They put it into prisons. They put it into hospitals, and they put it into schools. And when beef prices fall, they do the same thing. And suddenly you see cheeseburgers all over <coughs> schools, not because anyone thought that America's already out of shape kids need another cheeseburger, but because kids are used as a pawn. They're used as pawns in an agribusiness game that nobody wants to change. There was an effort to change this with the Farm Bill debate. Do you remember this? In 2007, the Farm Bill was up for a renewal. And there was a big voice to say, let's stop this. We are subsidizing sugar to the, the level of billions of dollars every year. Dairy products, meat. And there was a big move to change it, but people on both sides of the aisle looked at where their campaign contributions came from. And there was no success for any single measure that reformed the farm subsidy program. So now we're thinking, well, how do we pay for the fact that we're heavy, that we're out of shape, that we have diabetes, that we have high cholesterol levels, and that we need drugs to fix this problem. Well, a few things need to, need to happen. In 2003, the National Institutes of Health funded my team to try a new approach to type 2 diabetes. What we did is we brought in people who had this disease. On average, they had it for eight years. And the diet that we put them on was a low-fat vegan diet. Now, vegans are not people from the planet Vegas. They're people who are not eating milk or uh, meat or eggs. And we kept oils low and sugar low. That was the whole program. We didn't use exercise, we didn't use drugs, it was just, just simple diet and lifestyle changes. We published our findings first in Diabetes Care, and uh, several publications have come out after that, the most recent in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition earlier this year. Bottom line, this program is not only better than a more uh, typical diabetes diet, but it reduces hemoglobin A1C, our main index of blood sugar control, more than typical over the, or, uh, prescription oral diabetes medication. So, if we as a country decide, instead of investing in figuring out how to pay for sickness, why don't we figure out how to invest in keeping ourselves well, and more importantly, <coughs> our children well? Now, I have to say that this message doesn't go over uh, equally big in all parts of the country. I was in Lubbock, Texas, not too long ago, and I was talking about the merits of a vegetarian diet. And, um, <laughs> at, uh, <laughs> I noticed that the audience uh, at the college I was talking about kept kind of tittering as I was talking, and then they got sort of louder, and then I was mentioning Dean Ornish's work on vegetarian diets to reverse heart disease, and they started heckling me. I finally said, hey, wait a minute. You guys can heckle me as much as you want to, but this, I, I have to tell you, atherosclerosis that occurs, it leads to all kinds of problems in the body, and they started shouting at me, and really giving me a hard time. They didn't want to hear about me being bad. I finally just had to say, look, you guys, a meaty diet doesn't just cause coronary artery disease, it can also make you impotent. <laughs> and finally, you could have heard a pin drop in this room. I wasn't making this up. I wasn't making this up. The, the, the male sexual anatomy is a hydraulic system that um, is obviously devised on the Monday because things are going wrong with it all the time. But if you don't get good blood flow, you don't... Are you with me? <laughs> yes, anyway. 
so by the time kids would get their high school diploma, they already have the beginnings of coronary artery disease. And, and a, a man who is in his 50s and has the onset of impotence has coronary artery disease in the vast majority of cases. So I finally realized that we should stop talking about coronary artery disease in Lipitor. We should start talking about what Americans care about. Take that message to Capitol Hill and remind them that a bad diet affects all parts of our body. As a nation, we can do better and manage disease. We can make a commitment to health. Thank you. Turning vegan vegan tomorrow. Oh, I love it when I get to follow comments like that. Uh, I want to go to the question of what is mind, body, and spirit health or medicine or whatever phrase you want to use. And there are people who have been defining this for years, but I have never read something quite as profound as this. Let us learn and practice what we instinctively know to be a fact, namely that the present day generation and misery of the human race cannot be alleviated by laws and regulations, by loans and covenants, but improvement must come from within ourselves. It must come through a complete rebirth, through different mental attitude, different conception and conduct of life the return of naturalness, true religion, simplicity, frugality, economy, and joyous renunciation, through upbringing and uplifting, through honesty and tolerance, through purposeful strengthening of mind, body, and soul, so that we will again feel throbbing life within us, strong and powerful, enabling us to again enjoy life, nature, family life, art, book, picture, and song, and to bear bravely whatever pains and vicissitude life holds in store for us. Written in 1925 by Benedict Luce, who is the father of American naturopathic medicine in this country. I find that very telling that the words are as appropriate today as they were in 1925. Uh, most of you, I'm going to guess, don't know a lot about naturopathic medicine, but I can tell you that sums up the spirit, the nature, the heart, and the work of what a naturopathic doctor does every day. Um, it is medicine, that it is a, it is a great degree that's bestowed by accredited schools recognized by the Department of Education in seven institutions in North America, licensed in 15 jurisdictions, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and Virgin Islands. Not as robust yet as we would like, but very powerful presence. And I say that it's a powerful presence because of the nature of the medicine itself and the, and the passion of the people who participate in this field. Uh, as the AMP, uh, and we have all of the sort of formalities of what a medical profession or any licensed profession would be with testing, accreditation standards, the whole nine yards, the AMP itself is only about 2,000 members strong right now. There are probably 5,000 naturopathic doctors in North America who are licensed, so that would include Canada. But we've decided to do things a little differently at the AMP. While everyone is pretty much moving their deck chairs around on the ship that's slowly sinking called healthcare, we started seven years ago when the organization moved from Seattle to Washington, D.C. to start a new conversation. First, we had to teach people whether it was naturopath or naturopath, and the answer is yes. <laughs> there is no wrong answer in naturopathic medicine. There is no um, standardized plan for what naturopathic medicine is. Every individual is treated as such, and the goal of a naturopathic doctor is, elim is to eliminate the barriers that are restricting your body's ability to heal itself. That's exactly what that is. Now, it creates an interesting dynamic, in my opinion, although I think all associations like mine have the same problem, Motiv motivating people to join together in a common cause can be very challenging. I say that the naturopathic field is more challenging because they've so been so indoctrinated in the belief that every individual is so unique that it is difficult to find benefit in group work. So that's been my challenge over the last seven years. Our conversation that we're having uh, is not necessarily about what this program will reimburse or how it is financed or whether states rights will be maintained for licensed providers in any jurisdiction although as you can tell by those comments we certainly are having those conversations i say that all of us in this world have our work that we must do in the legislative battles that we continue to have to wage on a daily basis 
And we are busy in many different ways bringing forces together to work on the common language of what healthcare can be in the future. So when you go to take what the naturopathic this is and say that the body has an innate ability to heal itself and you take that to legislative lawyers and say, now please turn this into a piece of legislation, it actually comes back and says everyone should have vaccinations. Oh, that's a little bit of a red flag for the naturopathic community as well as most of the alternative medical providers. So we worked with the lawyers to get the language written that now has drawn the support of the American Medical Student Association, the American Holistic Medical Association, the American Chiropractic Association, and the list goes on and on. Uh, our journal is the Journal of Natural Medicine. It's an online journal. It's free. It has a subscription of over 100,000 people already, and we have only issued one journal thus far. Where we take this um, is dependent upon our ability to inspire people, specifically patients. And I know Jen will talk to that more in terms of the consumer efforts around this. So when you look at what real health care is and can be, and you know that changing behaviors requires that somebody is personally motivated, regardless of what level of hormones we're talking about and what sex group, uh, one of the things that, that, that comes to mind is that this is a community. This health has to be about a community process. And I was, as I was looking for inspiration last night to talk to you all today and doing a little cable grazing, I came across America's Biggest Loser. And to me, it was so telling that the success of that show, amongst all the cable garbage that we see, and certainly the reality TV, is that this is a community of people who want each other to succeed, just as any family would. And, that, and the success that I see my doctors have with cases that are hard sells and people changing behavior um, and psychology to better their health instead of going for that quick fix of the pill is reflected in that television show beautifully, wanting everyone to succeed and staying together. So it's really kind of heartwarming to see. So the question then becomes, how do you replicate that? How do you make people feel as passionate about transforming health into real health, whether it's through education, through exercise, through your environment, that all of these things are so deeply entrenched in what healthcare can be, versus having people so equally inspired to get into the battle of what they have, what they don't have. And our philosophy at the AMP, in terms of the staff and the board, is that this work must serve. And I think this is kind of an interesting sort of place where people are, their frustrations are rising to the surface very quickly because they don't see that this will benefit future generations to come. And if that's the case, I might agree with them. As I said to the Boston Globe not too long ago, the best thing that can happen in this health care reform bill, well, there are a few okay things, is that more people are forced into a system so it will collapse that much faster and we can get to the real work at hand. Um, but that's where we work, and that's what we do on a daily basis, and that's where we hope that it, we get to touch each of your lives. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm going to take a little different uh, view of this, but I think complementary to what we've already heard, and especially taking off on your running shoe um, thesis. Um, there is no question, as we've heard, that lifestyle and particular exercise and diet all contribute to preventing disease. And, and I agree, we must change the dynamic from medicine focused on curing disease to what can we do each in our own lives to maintain health and prevent disease or to help us heal if we already have disease. Um, I'm going to start with uh, a definition of mind-body medicine. Our, our, our moderator had tasked us with this, so I thought I would uh, do my homework. And um, if you go on the web and to the National Center of Complementary and Alternative Medicine, you can find a definition of mind-body medicine, which I will read. Interactions among brain, mind, body, and behavior, and ways in which emotional, mental, social, spiritual and behavioral factors influence health. I want to add another component, which I think most of us 
don't pay much attention to, but which really plays a big role in helping us to maintain health. And that's the place and space around us. How many of you, when you came to this room, actually really noticed the details of the room? You may have felt a, a sort of an emotional response that you didn't even, weren't even aware of. Um, in my new book, uh, The um, Healing Spaces, The Science of Place and Well-Being, I explore what is known in many of the uh, sciences, in uh, neuroscience, in immunology, about how we perceive place and space around us and how the emotions, the memories that are triggered that then trigger emotions responding to that space can either help us heal, foster healing, foster health, or can actually do us harm if they trigger negative emotions. And there's a lot of science behind it, which obviously I don't have time to talk about today. Um, but I'll, I'll describe two cases which, uh, in which I start the book with one of the cases and the other, which is the focus of the television show, the PBS, PBS television special that was mentioned earlier that, um, that I'm hosting. Um, the first one is the famous uh, study by Roger Ulrich, who was an environmental psychologist who published a paper in Science Magazine um, in 1984 showing that patients who were recovering from gallbladder surgery, whose beds were beside windows with views of nature, a grove of trees, healed on the average a day faster and needed less pain medication than patients who had a view of a brick wall. And this study, this kind of health outcome study, has been reproduced over and over and over again in many different settings. And it's very clear that windows, or something about windows, or something about the view out windows, helps patients in hospitals heal. And so the question I ask in the book, in the first chapter, is what is it about those windows that helped those patients heal? Was it what they saw? Was it the light? Was it the color? Was it the view? Was it the nature? Was it what they heard? Was it what they smelled? Was there something else about the space that helped them to, for example, meditate? Was it something about the space in general that can help people exercise or foster exercise. And you can really go through each of those questions and construct a very strong case drawing from many of the sciences and clinical research that proves that in fact many of these features of the built environment can, through triggering memories and emotions that are positive, can help you heal. Um, negative uh, features of the built environment that prevent you, for example, from exercising. If you were to take your running shoes and try to run down um, 495, for example, it would not be very good for you your health. Try there once. You try to, no, don't, don't try, try this at home. Um, you know, so there are features of the environment that prevent people from exercising, like lack of sidewalks, um, the loop and lollipop suburbs uh, that are not walkable, and, and so on. There's a lot of information in urban planning that, that gives information about that. And that changing that kind of structure and environment can help foster exercise and help reduce that obesity uh, epidemic that we have in the United States today. Of course, it's not the only thing. In, in the television show, we focus on my own experience of the role of place in healing. I uh, am trained as a rheumatologist, as you heard. I'm an arthritis doc. Um, and I discovered in my research that the part of the brain that controls the stress response, the hypothalamus, is very important in susceptibility and resistance to inflammatory diseases like arthritis. About 12 years ago, I went through a, an extreme period of stress in my life. Um, it was about 10 years after I'd made that discovery of the role of the stress response in arthritis. I went through this stressful period when my mother was dying of breast cancer. And I myself developed inflammatory arthritis. I, the irony was not lost on me, um, but for the first time in my life, I really understood what I had been studying in very emotion-stripped academic terms. I understood how stress can make you sick. 
Of course I have the genes. I wouldn't have gotten the arthritis if I didn't have the genes. But I'm convinced that the point in my life at which I developed that arthritis was determined by the fact that I'd undergone this chronic stress. Serendipitously, and I will not tell you the story because you can tune in to Maryland Public Television on Sunday at 3.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> Plug for PBS, and if you're uh, not in the MPT uh, viewing area, you can watch for the show nationwide um, in December. Uh, so serendipitously, I was invited to go to Crete, to a tiny village on the south coast of, Lenta, of Crete, which was called Lentus, and I experienced a transformation. It's not that you know some unknown. <coughs> power came down upon me. I understood what I was doing wrong back home by not exercising, by not eating a healthy Mediterranean diet, by not giving myself a chance to meditate, contemplate, and heal. And it started me on the road to healing. And I have maintained that lifestyle to the present day. I feel well. It's not that I have to throw my medication and my bag of pills out the window. Um, but what happened is I allowed my body to heal. And really that is the thesis, not only of the show, but of my uh, two books uh, and the most recent book, where the most powerful healing organ in the body is the brain is your own brain and your own mind. And if you can find that space and place around you that helps you heal, you will heal. You will maintain health. And even if you have a, a disease, even a, 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 a severe disease or even a terminal disease, it is important to remember the difference between healing and curing. In America, I think today, we think about medicine and health as curing. Give me a pill, give me a vaccine, give me something to cure me. We may not be able to cure you, but we can help you heal, no matter how ill you are. And, and place and space around you and space within your mind can do all of that. So I think I'll leave it at that. And we can discuss We did have the assignment of coming up with the definition of uh, uh, body-mind healing, but uh, what I did is to, um, I want to ground uh, the thinking of um, health in this uh, setting in the World Health Organization definition of health, because it uh, always um, brings me back to a, a sense of uh, the real issues that we're dealing with. This was adopted in 1948, and it says, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Uh, my own basic feeling is that if we had followed that definition starting in 1948, we would not be where we are today in our healthcare situation. Um, in the United States today, we have um, the highest cost healthcare system, uh, twice as high as Switzerland, which is the next highest. Uh, we spend roughly 20% of our um, gross national product is, is involved in health care. A little bit more than that, and we're going to probably be heading toward bankruptcy uh, as a country. Uh, General Motors uh, bankruptcy was largely influenced by the fact that it was uh, several thousand dollars in each car was to cover the health care program of the company. And that's true of many of the large uh, multinational corporations in the United States. At the same time that we have the highest cost healthcare system, we have the least productive healthcare system in the industrial world. We basically, we rank 35th in the world. We are uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 25th in life expectancy, roughly the same for um, mortality. And we have, uh, shockingly to me, we're somewhere between uh, 35 and 40, 40th in the world in um, infant, in, in, I'm sorry, in maternal mortality, women dying in childbirth. 
this is an extraordinary set of statistics. Um, we supposedly have a healthcare debate going on in the United States, something about something that Congress is trying to do. But as nearly as I can tell, all I can find in the debate is how are we going to finance the system that we currently have. Um, the best that can be said in terms of the cost part problem is maybe we can squeeze some of the waste out. But there's not been any kind of serious examination that I can find, and I'd be delighted to hear from anyone who's found it, of thinking differently about health care. Thinking differently about how we actually address the ultimate wants and needs of individuals in relation to health and wellness. That's not been on the table as I can see it. The kinds of issues that we were discussing and three people have discussed so far uh, have not been uh, headlines in the so-called health reform debate. And I think they should be, or at least we should figure out a way to get them there. Now, uh, it was mentioned that I started out in 1968 in Washington working with Ralph Nader. And I, my, the area that I worked on was the Food and Drug Administration. And my, my basic point about the Food and Drug Administration was it didn't function very well. Um, my specific focus was uh, food protection at the FDA. Uh, we now have a food safety bill coming through that's addressing issues I was raising in 1968 and addressing them badly, but that's a side issue for today. Uh, what, I, what I noted in working on the issues in Washington that I came, became involved with, uh, first was food safety, uh, then uh, there was the whole question of, uh, of drugs and the healthcare system, and then I got involved in some other issues. But what intrigued me was that our system, our way of thinking about addressing any problem, any, any course of behavior, is very, very narrow and very straight-jacketed. I got involved with Nader because in law school I had to study his activities as, a, as an assignment for an entire year. We had a thing called the Auto Safety Summit, and we spent a day a week for a year in law school working on the issue of auto safety. And what I noticed in Nader's critique, who was known widely as an auto safety critic, was that he was not actually an auto safety critic, he was actually a corporate responsibility critic. He was saying the major decisions in our society are being made by concentrated economic interests, primarily multinational corporations. And they were making decisions that were not democratically disciplined, and therefore came out with bad answers, bad solutions. And then he said, it was like two pages in a law journal article. Then he said, now let me give you an example. And he put 50 pages in about the auto industry and all the things that the auto industry was doing, being undisciplined, unfocused, having no, no, uh, no place to reference what it was doing other than it could get people to buy its cars. And it did that by all kinds of structural interventions. Like for example, eliminating all uh, inner city transit that was on rails. Just went right across the country, eliminated it all. So everybody had to have a car. That was, in, that was in autos. But when I looked at food, found the same thing in food. And then I looked at healthcare, and you found exactly the same structure. And what I wanted to figure out was how can we approach that problem of the way we think and the way we act in the society. And I, it, it seemed to me that the best way to do that, uh, and I've been doing this in the law firm that I started right after leaving Nader, is to create a point of purchase alternative that individual consumers could choose to better fulfill their own internal, uh, personal wants and needs. And then secondly, to create a distribution system that would allow that to be delivered to the customer or the consumer. And then thirdly, it would need to have a set of ideas that underpin this point of purchase activity and the distribution system. When we did food uh, and worked in the food area, we started uh, looking carefully for what would be an alternative that we could put at the point of purchase. And the thing we found was uh, biodynamic farming. Um, you might want to just Google it and look at it. You'll see it's probably the most productive way you could do food uh, anywhere in the world. And the Chinese use it, the French have used it, it's been around, it's powerful. But we did not have a distribution system for that. There may be, there's a claim that there may be as many as 30,000 um, activities in this country that are producing biodynamic food, but we couldn't create a system out of it. And so we stepped back to organic food, and we began the idea of saying, well, let's create 
an alternative at the point of purchase that has a distribution system and has a set of ideas that underpin it so that people as consumers, as people who are trying to satisfy their needs and desires, needs and wants, can come to a place and actually do it. The first thing we had to do, just so you understand what kind of society we live in, I, I, I tell people, uh, however bad you think it is, it's probably a hundred times worse. The first thing we had to do was fight the Federal Trade Commission and stop it in 1975 from banning the words natural, organic, and health food from Congress. A 12-week hearing on nutrition food rule, you know, food and nutrition rules, one of the rules was going to be no more organic, no more natural, no more health food. Fortunately, we won that battle or there wouldn't be organic food today. We then had to work very hard to create a framework that allowed organic food to be recognized in the market. And so there were dozens and dozens of certifying agencies across the country. Then there was legislation adopted that, that codified the standards, and it's a complicated, we can talk about it in questions if you want, but it's a system. What, when we got to the issue of the healthcare system, first thing we looked at was homeopathy. You should Google homeopathy and look at homeopathy and see what it looks like. It's a very powerful system. And uh, no, no method for distribution in the United States. So what we, what we hit on in our little section of the world, this is way, way back in 1980. There wasn't a lot of talk about alternative medicine in 1980. In 1980, we got involved in acupuncture. And, and frankly, from, from my perspective, acupuncture has been a cutting edge technology to move, the, to open the mind of this society to alternatives. So I was, you know, I'm just interested to know that until 1996, acupuncture needles were technically illegal in the United States. The FDA, if you, the FDA would seize acupuncture needles if you tried to bring them into the United States. Our law firm um, actually took the work for two and a half years to get that changed if we were successful. But, but again, understand what we're dealing with in the, in the kind of a culture that we, that we have. The, uh, the um, idea of bringing acupuncture forward was to create a space for something other than what the Medical Practices Acts in the United States decreed. And these acts were, first of all, only doctors could treat people. Anything else was the unauthorized practice of medicine, which was a crime. A crime. And, in the, and when we started in 1980, acupuncturists were going to jail. And we worked very hard to create a set of standards, to create um, educational standards, to create, uh, as I said, practice standards, educational standards, uh, an organization of schools, and to create essentially a profession, pretty much what uh, Karen's going through with the nature, nature paths now. And every one of the professions is having to do that, uh, to, to become capable of fitting into that template that I, I, I think is fitting into that template I talked about before, which is providing a way of getting people access to these things. Um, the uh, the uh, acupuncture dynamic worked very well, and uh, it was uh, at a certain point people started talking about it being kind of a mainstream thing. Um, uh, one of the important facts about I'm going to use acupuncture, but it's true of all of the alternatives. There are ways of doing cost accounting on the body mind. By the way, acupuncture is a very strong body mind spirit connection. It's, uh, it's not, uh, it's, it's not a mechanistic approach, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a full space approach, including the space of stunning and, the, and the, both the internal and external space. You can, at the same time that you're dealing with that kind of uh, body-mind-spirit integration, create cost accounting mechanisms that will show you that this kind of an approach actually can create better health at lower costs. Just some examples. Um, when we had to show the FDA that acupuncture needles should be legal, a uh, lot of scientific information was gathered. Um, and among, among the things that we were able to show was that um, if uh, that, that acupuncture in the immediate aftermath of a stroke, um, this is a reviewed, peer reviewed study, Boston University Medical School reduces the impact of the stroke by about 30%. And they've measured subjective measures to come up with that. That was one of the studies we turned in. Um, one of my thoughts is that from, a, from the standpoint of uh, a system, it would be really great if every first responder uh, knew how to handle the uh, very, uh, very specific 
uh, acupuncture stroke uh, protocol. And you could have a major impact on society. One of the acupuncture groups in this country, the one that does uh, uh, drug detoxification, which has had a major impact, um, would like to expand that into emergency rooms for asthma. If you use the acupuncture asthma uh, protocol in emergency rooms, you could re reduce the uh, time of an asthma patient in an emergency room from eight hours to one hour. And one of the major places that we have blockage and cost in the system is emergency rooms with lots of people with asthma taking up space. There are, there are dozens of those kinds of things that exist in the, in the area of medicine that is not in this mainstream mechanized area, which is fundamentally drugs, radiation, and surgery for the most part. Um, when, I, when I looked at the definitions, I, I want to, um, and we at Citizens for Health, I'll tell you a little bit about Citizens for Health and then stop. Uh, we are going to um, and have approached the World Health Organization to include uh, spiritual in its definition. We'll see if we can get that uh, corrected and, or, or expanded. Then it would read, because I think it's good to hear the definition one more time. Uh, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and spiritual and social well-being. Spiritual and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. That's what we're working for. That what that means um, in a in an important way, given the framework that I've laid out is that we have uh, a, a way in creating things in this society that make them be industrial. And that's the great thing that the Americans invented, was the industrial approach. And we have an industrial health system at this point. And what, we're, what we are attempting to do at Citizens for Health and a lot of the alternative communities that are involved, and I keep trying to avoid the word alternative, but emerging communities, is to create something which I call a personal or individual health approach. It's a, it's a dynamic. The, in, the, in, the industrial institutional dynamic is a public, fixed, and objective dynamic. It's set to at norms. And you, you can see this in the food supply where they talk about recommended daily allowances. The idea is that there's something you can find that works for everyone. Um, and there, you know, there are ranges of that, but by and large everyone's pretty much the same and if you can uh, just do enough research and do enough statistics and so forth. You'll find the right thing for whatever it is you're looking to solve. The personal individual approach is different. It's personal, relative, and subjective. It's based around the fact that every individual has a particular identity. So, for example, uh, in, the area, uh, in the area of biology, we would have uh, a, uh, uh, a, a um, individual chemical profile. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a known concept. Biochemical individuality was articulated in the 1950s by a member of the National Academy of Sciences and kind of languished there forever. But you can also Google that and see that there are people attempting to bring that idea more fully into the process. But the notion is quite different than there's a normative thing that we can all arrive at versus every individual has an optimum, an optimum framework that is, is going to be best for them. The, in, the industrial institutional system is reductionist, mechanistic, and mechanical. It looks at people as uh, the way a car, I mean, a car shop looks at a car. You know, we can take this piece out, put this piece in. That's not totally bad. I mean, there are absolutely places that that's valuable. The important problem, however, is that that's almost all we have in our basic system. And we need more in the, the thing that we argue from the personal individual side, and we say that we need integral, organic, and vital uh, ideas. That's the idea system behind uh, what we're talking about. And um, the, the notion is that we are not uh, mechanisms to be adjusted. We are actually uh, forces uh, to be nurtured and, and, and expressed and, and, uh, and fed in, in all ways. And when you move in that direction, the point I'm making is when you move in that direction, I'm arguing, and we think there's data to show, that you will end up with a healthcare system that ranks much higher on the level of re relationships in the world. Maybe we can move from 35 to something a little higher than that. Lower by number, but higher on the list. Uh, we can do it at a, co at a cost savings. We can actually, these are not. Uh, these, these, the expense of doing this is far lower than the expense of maintaining these uh, drug-based regimens. 
And we have some concepts, some ideas that actually treat people as being alive and being, being vital that they can engage in this whole system. And that process will create a, a whole lot of awareness, including, I think, the space awareness that you're talking about. Uh, this, this, this dynamic, this kind of an approach, seems to me to be what should be at the heart of the health reform debate and is not. Um, and uh, part of the reason it's not there is because the structure of our system itself is industrial. It, the, the political system mirrors exactly the system that creates a mechanistic uh, food system and a mechanistic uh, health system and so forth right down the line. And what we have is a mechanistic legal system. One of the main uh, points of the uh, personal individual approach to healthcare, as Karen mentioned, is uh, the, innate, the innate capacity or intelligence of the body to heal itself. That's a crucial part of all of this. Well, our political process has that innate capability too, but it's been diverted. Uh, one of my book is available out at the, wherever they have the books available here. It's called uh, Voice of the People, The Transpartisan Imperative in American Life. The concept that we're dealing with in that book, and myself and a co-author who's, I'm, I'm called the liberal, he's called the conservative, neither of us believes that those are real concepts, but, and we explain that in the book. But the idea is that if you integrate the different approaches that we have to any problem in the society, you'll come up with a better answer than if you use just one set of ideas or another. That's a vitalist concept, that's a vitalist thinking. And the, the metaphor for that is that if we ran, uh, if, if, if we ran getting around the way we run our industrial system, we would have one team argue that we should walk on our right foot and the other team would argue that we should walk on our left foot. There would be a debate, uh, there would be a vote, and then 52 to 48, one would win and then we would hop. <laughs> That's the way we are making most of the decisions in our culture. And uh, the, the whole notion of consciousness, transformation, body, mind, spirit, integration uh, in health is a major set of concepts to help us stop doing that. Thank you. You know, you've heard four very provocative presentations, provocative in a good sense, and the thought-provoking, and I have lots of notes and lots of questions and lots of comments, and they probably have comments questions for each other. But I'd like to begin by getting questions and comments from you, since you're here in person. If you were on television, you couldn't ask questions, so now is your chance. And I'm going to ask you to, if you don't mind, I'm going to do my best to see this first. Maybe stand up and speak loudly, and if you like, give your name and tell us briefly who you are and why you're here. Whether you're a student, politician, concerned citizen, physician, acupuncturist, um, to give a sense of, of uh, where your question is coming from. So I saw a few hands, and I'll start on this side. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, my name is Anne Marie Jane, and I'm here with uh, Mark Harrison's class for uh, consciousness and anger when I've heard it. Oh, and the class is a lot of things. But um, uh, my comment is for the gentleman sitting next to you, the moderator. Sorry. This is uh, Neil Neil Barnard. Yes. Um, but uh, I myself, I've been a vegan for one year, and I was vegetarian for a year before that. And I just want to say how what, excited and thrilled I am to hear like a medical professional talking about the benefits of vegetarianism and veganism because so many uh, doctors, nutritionists, et cetera, um, you know, they're operating on old research and, you know, stuff coming down to the government, like the food pyramid that told you you can eat so many servings of meat and dairy today. We were talking about how the government subsidizes all that stuff and it does really seem like a conflict of interest. And so I just want to tell you that I really appreciate what you're doing and I hope that you keep doing it and um, hopefully you can get more doctors to uh, you know, start talking about that and sort of introduce that to people more. So thank you very much. Thank you for your, thank you for your comments and congratulations on your diet change. It's a good, a good move. Um, uh, I maybe should have introduced, um, if people want more information about this, our organization is Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. We have the website pcrm.org. Um, again, that's pcrm.org. 
Uh, we have a related website called nutritionmd.org, and there are lots of recipes on there, maybe about a thousand of them, and uh, information on everything from acne to varicose veins, and it's no, no commercial sponsorship, so dig in. Uh, just one quick comment. Uh, in the past, doctors couldn't help but notice that vegetarians were healthier than other people, and epidemiologists have shown that they live longer, that they have much less cardiovascular disease, less likelihood of obesity. We thought, well, isn't that good? Um, it's, it's good that people be, become vegetarian or vegan. Um, however, I think we have to turn that around and say, it's not just that it's good to be vegan or vegetarian, it's bad to be eating the, all the things that aren't in that diet, and the, including the things that my extended family has been busily making money off of for a long period of time. Um, two big studies I might mention. Uh, in this country, Seventh-day Adventists have been studied a lot. And, and the reason is, I, mean, I have no affiliation with the Adventist church, but they've, they've lent themselves to research because there are certain religious tenets. They're not supposed to smoke, drink alcohol, use caffeine, or eat meat. And most Adventists are really good at the first three of those. But about half of them are actually sort of modest meat eaters, and half of them are, are vegetarian. And that sets up a wonderful natural experiment, health-conscious people, but some of them are meat eaters, some of them aren't. And nowadays there are so many of them. There was this, uh, in Diabetes Care, they published, I think it was in May of this year, they, they separated them into five groups, vegans, then lacto-ovo vegetarians, people who had, had milk and eggs then fish-eating people, but otherwise no meat, and then semi-vegetarians, people who occasionally had meat, and then regular meat-eaters. And the gradation was dramatic. The closer, you, the more meats, dairy products, the more animal products you added, the more likely you were to be heavy, and the more likely you were to have diabetes. And such that the risk of diabetes for the meat-eaters was about twice that, controlling for every other factor, including TV watching and exercise and everything else, compared to the vegans. Uh, you don't have to be an Adventist, you can be a European, um, in the EPIC study, uh, which is huge in, in going on a year for a long period of time, they found exactly the same gradient. So bottom line, um, it's taken us a while to realize this, but tobacco caused all that lung cancer we've been dealing with for a long period of time, and there were some other contributors like asbestos and so forth. Meat, dairy products, eggs, uh, things like trans fats, these things contribute to cardiovascular diseases, cancer, diabetes, and so forth. And we're trying to get our head around that. And what does it mean that we're all hooked on those kinds of foods? How do we get our culture away from it? How do we get our kids away from it? That's our current public health problem. So I congratulate you for having made this step you have. I'm sure you're influencing other people in a good way. Thank you. So how many miles of running counteracts a cheeseburger? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll tell you, in our, in our diabetes study, I had a man came in. He said, well, I'm really not doing so well on my diet. I think I need to just walk around. And uh, Stan Telfer, which is the doctor with me in the room, he said, I hate to tell you this, but the body is so efficient. To lose a pound, you'd have to walk to Baltimore. <laughs> so, <laughs> exercise is great, but it doesn't take the place, and it cannot make up for all that bad stuff. Thank you. Sure. Other comments from? Well, for those of you who cannot stand the thought of changing your diet to a vegan diet, please take heart. Um, when, when there is nothing more important to a naturopathic physician in terms of uh, working with the patient other than what they put in their body. The, the center of the soul for an ND is the gut. And we have, I'd say, anywhere from 10 to 20 percent of our physician population that are vegetarians or vegans. We have more doctors who have taken their diets and done them to interesting, extra, you know, different things. The wheat intolerances uh, amongst the population are growing every day. Cases of celiac that have been around forever now are being recognized. So there are the diet implications for how you change your diet, how dramatically you do that so you're successful, are ways that an ND would work with you on that. And I'm, I'm anxious to see, we had a, a lab company at our conference this year that did blood draws on cardiovascular health. Uh, cardiovascular disease and diabetes are both inflammatory diseases, so they're very closely related. It'll be interesting to see how our NDs fare in terms of the general population. I'd love to see how they fared in terms of the conventional medical world, but I don't believe anybody's going to do that study and release it. So there's, there's hope for all of us who don't want to be vegans. We can still lead really healthy lifestyles that don't have processed foods, artificial dyes, sweeteners, artificial sweeteners and are really whole food in nature, locally grown or organic, and keep going at it, because every bit of it counts. Thanks, I feel better now. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I also want to add to that last point, again, not to say anything against vegans or vegetarians, but there's really good evidence that a Mediterranean diet, which is uh, 
composed of very high content of fruits and fresh fruits and vegetables, locally grown fresh fruits and vegetables, and small portions of meat or fish. Um, so the, the balance of the veg vegetables and fruit is, is, is uh, the main point. And uh, olive oil is, is an important component of it. But there's, there's excellent evidence that the Mediterranean diet is, uh, is very good for your health. Dean Ornish uh, had published a, a terrific paper in Lancet last year that showed uh, that a simple lifestyle change that included a Mediterranean diet, 30 minutes of walking a day, so it doesn't have to be walking to Baltimore, but it does have to be every single day. Um, and a meditation intervention, a mindfulness meditation intervention um, every day, uh, resulted in an increase in the enzyme that repairs your chromosomes. The, there is a, the ends of chromosomes um, uh, are called telomeres. These are like the plastic ends of shoelaces, okay? So if you think about your shoelaces, as they get older, the plastic ends fall off, and then the shoelaces fray, and they become shorter. The same thing happens to your chromosomes. As you age, those little caps, those telomere ends, uh, become shorter, and the chromosomes become shorter and fray. And that uh, contributes to uh, illnesses associated with aging, but also stress, chronic stress, can speed that process, can speed the aging of your chromosomes by nine to 17 years older than your biological age. So if you're undergoing chronic stress, you're aging your chromosomes a whole lot faster. Um, and that healthy lifestyle intervention, uh, the Mediterranean diet, the 30 minutes of walking a day, and the um, uh, meditation exercise, can increase significantly in a period of three months. So you want to, this is the answer to your question. <laughs> in three months can increase the enzyme that repairs those chromosomes. So that was Dean Ornish, uh, published uh, about a year ago in The Lancet, if you want to look it up. So it's encouraging that there are things that we can actually do with our lifestyle to reverse those negative effects of stress. And they do include diet, and they include diets that are high in fresh fruits and vegetables, so that's important. Thank you. This is much what I've heard this afternoon is um, what individuals can do for themselves. I'm thinking of, of we have this term health care provider as if there's someone who's supposed to be providing us with something called health care as opposed to providing us with, uh, us with information that allows us to make healthier choices than we then need to make. So that's, that, that term itself suggests that someone's going to do something for you and to you as opposed to you doing something for yourself. For your own. But I want to move probably from, let's go over to this side. Yes, ma'am, in the red jacket. Hi, thanks for your commitment um, to wellness. Um, my name is Melissa Taylor. I'm a physician that does women's health. And um, I was real privileged to grow up with a mom that went organic when I was eight years old. And I've read several of your books, uh, Dr. Bernard. Um, one of the frustrations I know that I have is, and I deal mostly with women in, in my practice, is trying to get our country, women in general, and just an emphasis on children. And um, one of my friends who teaches in kindergarten in Fairfax County, her school just won a nutrition award for the school. And the school breakfast um, consisted of 65 grams of sugar. It was uh, frosted flakes chocolate milk, and then a small Danish. Oh and the God. school won an award because I believe it met all the RDAs. Oh my God. There was no protein. And so we still have this mindset. And in a you know, county like Fairfax County that's wealthy, um, and I actually went into the schools. I would go with all my kids. I have three kids. I go into the school with them one day every year with each kid through high school because they love that. And um, <laughs> look at the food and what the kids ate. <laughs> Uh, and I recently went into an elementary school, and there's no ladies there with hairnets anymore. Nothing's cooked. Everything's off-site. It's trucked in. They have um, a styrofoam tray for every kid for breakfast, and the school I went to has 60% uh, food, you know, lunch program and subsidies. How do we change that? I mean, we're in Fairfax County. Uh, there's intelligent people, I hope, in this county. And still we're serving kids crap. Um, <laughs> And it's just incredibly frustrating. And I just, I don't, there's not a health program in the school system that's adequate. Um, it's just very frustrating having grown up with 
a whole different emphasis in my life and still seeing, you know, 50 years later, it doesn't seem like we're getting anywhere. Um, well, first of all, your community is, is lucky to have you as, a, as an advocate, and, you, and kids are lucky to have you as well. Um, this is the perfect time. Congress, as soon as it gets its, health, its head out of health care, is going to deal with something called the Child Nutrition Act, which has to be renewed every five years. It's the groundwork for what kids are fed in schools, and it's coming up for renewal. We are advocating a number of changes, um, one of which is that kids who want a, a vegetarian meal should at least be able to have it sometimes. It doesn't mean they have to be vegetarian or vegan full time, but if once in a while they want to have something without meat in it, they ought to have that choice. Um, it's an uphill battle, believe it or not, to get that, but we're pushing for that. Um, there's a big push to get the vending machines either out of the schools or to get them cleaned out and put healthier things in. Needless to say, the dairy industry wants the Pepsi out and the milk in. Um, I think we can do better than both of those. Um, and uh, right now, lactose intolerant children, which is a lot of kids, and they all think they have some gastrointestinal disorder. It's totally normal to lose the ability to digest milk when you're no longer breastfeeding. Um, but that has been a fact that's been slow to dawn on communities and on policymakers. And we are trying to say that every kid should be able to have a non-dairy milk on request. They, don't, they shouldn't have to produce a doctor's note. Anyway, we have a website, healthyschoollunches.org. Please go there. It's healthyschoollunches.org. There's a petition you can sign. We've got a hundred and some thousand people have already signed saying they want exactly this. We're presenting it to Congress. We're on Capitol Hill every day. And if anybody here wants to go to Capitol Hill with us, I will take you there. And um, we're, we're, we've got a big, big battle against every single purveyor of foods is eyeing the 94,000 schools where the school lunch uh, program um, that takes place because they see it as a huge market. But, is, but, is there gluten? Is there any gluten-free alternative? Because the thing that impresses me is that these kids are just loaded up with gluten. I mean, mm -hmm. to an incredible extent, oh, sure, and you see sure. all the brain fog. We did in, in Broward County. We did a test. Uh, Broward County, Florida is the fifth or sixth biggest school district in the country and very diverse in every way you can imagine. And the question was, kids want to eat healthy, healthy things. So we featured three things. One uh, was a, a veggie burger. It was the garden burger, grilled, plain grilled burger. Um, the other was just beans and rice, but we called it something nicer than that, um, black beans and rice. And the third was a vegetarian chili. And all we did is we sent a dietitian to talk to the parents so they knew it was coming. And the day before it was unveiled in the cafeteria, they went through the cafeteria and gave kids a taste of a veggie burger or whatever. The kids took a taste and thought, you know, that's okay. And then we gave them a sticker that said, I vegged out. And the other kids would say, I want that sticker. How did you get that? <laughs> All the kids would taste this. Then the next day they just served it to them. It was familiar. They weren't afraid of it. And the veggie burgers outsold everything. And even simple beans and rice. People who think kids won't eat healthy foods just aren't really thinking of it. In my view, we did the same thing in Salem, Massachusetts, but it was all commodity foods that we used. And one was, I think it was bean tacos, and another was like a pasta salad uh, with beans. Very simple, very cheap. It was actually money saving. And, and sold really, really well. If you, if, you, if you help the kids to understand helpful food, you can really succeed. Anyway, that website, healthyschoollunches.org. We're seeing what we can do. That'll come up later this year. Other, other comments from anyone else? Well, I, I'm going to speak to Jim's comment about how this whole thing happens. I mean, you've seen the voluntary pullout of the soda machines in the schools across the country, obviously preempting a legislative action, but it didn't happen until they had a drink to replace it with. So the economic engine behind this is very difficult. So now instead of sodas in the schools, you'll see vitamin waters, or ask, a lot of aspartame, but we won't even get into that. Um, and, and what I have seen very successfully, and this is a place where I think as individuals, everybody says, how can I do anything individually? It's so big, it's so hard. But we have so many ways to be able to impact that as students. I've seen our students do very successful learn to grow programs in, in, in gardens at schools. I've seen miniature salad and fruit bars put into schools with farm to school programs. I've had doctors go in and work with the school district and say one new meal a month. It's just just as Neil said, just small steps every month. Add a new meal because in some time, it's sometimes it's just the it's the massive um, bureaucracy around the nutritionist who's in charge of the menu planning and just educating people around that. And then of course we've all seen if you've been reading or if you have kids what's happening at the elementary school level with snack 
and cupcakes and kind of driven by the whole peanut allergy thing. So I think there's a million ways for us to be able to impact that directly. And keep in mind, this is a Congress that would not allow food stamps to cover prenatal vitamins. It still does not allow that expenditure. So we have a long way to go. I, I want to just make another comment also. Um, the, my, our experience is that the people who are uh, actually at the, um, you know, going to the stores and living their lives are open to a lot of these ideas. They are not closed. Mostly they're blocked by various ways that things are done. An example <coughs> that I am, uh, saw with a person that we do a lot of work with, uh, he's a, an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley who retired at the age of 44 of a billionaire and started taking his son to uh, the soccer games. And uh, noticed that the parents that were coming to the soccer games were bringing things from McDonald's and the other fast food places. And so he decided, because of the way he thinks, uh, I'll create a um, snack stand right here with healthy snacks. And he talked to the parents first and said, look, I'm gonna do this, how do you feel about it, and so on. Well, first of all, they liked it because they could come right there and get the snack. They didn't have to stop on the way. And they liked that it was a healthy snack. So he built that into a business, and it got to be a business, and other soccer teams, other soccer venues were using it. Now he has a contract with the local school system to provide that service into the, into the school lunch program. So I, I'm just saying that the, the resistance is more structural than it is personal. It's more the way we set things up than it is the way people would like things to be. Thank you, and thanks for a very so interesting question. Um, then move back over to this side, maybe. Um, yes, sir. White shirt. I saw your hand earlier. Uh, my name is Bill Sinton. Um, among other things, I teach metaphysics, meditation. Um, I guess I'm a professional transformational junkie. Um, and a lot of my questions got addressed by the previous, so there's a little bit of that. Um, when we talk about policy change kind of talk about really altering a very fundamental discourse, which faces a lot of entrenched interests. So for example, when you talk about, uh, Dr. Harvey, you talk about the agencies that are aligned with you, the 800 pound gorilla that's not a more like the AMA, okay? And Mr. Turner, when you talk about creating, was it, uh, what was the first source of food prior to our organics? So the other one was actually more- Biodynamic. Thank you. And you create a structure for deliverance, but one of the discourses, at least in our society is, you know, there has to be demand. So you're actually talking about altering a very fundamental way that we relate to heaven's work um, and dealing with these entrenched interests. So I guess my question is, have you yet discovered any fundamental conversation that will make a difference at the legislative level? You know, really reduce the resistance that you've been dealing with? And is well, what are they? Um, the, the, uh, premise of the book, uh, Voice of the People, The Transparency and Imperative in American Life, addresses that question. Cool. And um, the, the, uh, the argument of the book is that actually the population is very um, uh, enlightened as individual people. They are very uh, tuned in to all of the kinds of things that uh, would create a more constructive um, response to just about every issue. There, there's a higher consciousness, there's more transformations or among the population than there is in the institutions. And, and very, so very specific, we analyzed it very carefully. So for example, there's a big argument that um, the country is very uh, uh, partisan. There's a lot of partisan debate in the country. There's no data that supports that. The, the data all shows that the country is very, pretty, pretty homogenous except for the 10 or 15% at each end. The structure of the system is designed so that those 10 or 15% are the ones that end up being the spokespeople for what's going on in the institutional framework. Two thirds of the population does not identify as either Republican or Democrat in, in one way or another. That is, I'm talking about the adult population. That is, um, a large portion does not actually register to vote at all. Another large portion that registers to vote, the largest group that registers to vote is independent. And then when uh, the voting comes, a whole raft of people who are registered don't vote. And you end up with a situation which most of the country is neither identifying as a Democrat or a Republican, but all the decisions are made by people who have to be either a Democrat or a Republican. We're calling that a structural problem. And every single issue that we address, that structural problem exists. 
And, uh, and uh, we have some thoughts about how to change that and, and, and what it means, but I, I just put that out as a, uh, the, 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 just, just real quickly, we, we're, we're in, in, we're, there's a, the, uh, the, the Examiner online newspaper, uh, we have uh, several columns in there talking about this fairly regularly. Uh, the book is talking about it, and the, the point we make is that the spectrum, left-right spectrum, is not useful in helping us understand what's happening. If you want to have an interesting experience, Google something called strange bedfellows, and you'll find story after story of right-wing and left-wing, by societal measures, working together for something. Um, uh, uh, we, 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 we say expand the, uh, the spectrum to a matrix, and the matrix that we, we start with, and this is just a little step in the right direction, it's not by any means the answer, it's the beginning, but we say, look at left, right as a horizontal uh, part of this the matrix, and then look at order freedom as the vertical, and you'll end up with four rather than two uh, situations you know, in every argument. You'll have free left, order left, free right, uh, order right. Many of the battles in the culture are between order left and free left on one side, uh, I'm sorry, order right and free right, I'm sorry. order right and order left on one side, and free right and free left on the other. And a simple way of catching that is look at the campaign uh, uh, reform bill. It's called the, uh, it's called, uh, the McCain-Feingold bill, you know, like law. Mm -hmm. McCain is about as conservative a senator as you could have, and Feingold is clearly the most liberal. They join together to create an order answer. Fighting them are the National Rifle Association and the American Civil Liberties Union as free left and free right. I mean, free right and free left. I mean, and that battle is repeated over and over. We had to lobby organic food through the Congress. In order to uh, lobby organic through food through the Congress since 1980, we were able to create, I'm sorry, 1990, we were able to create a a spectrum that no one, I mean, a, a, a set of political supporters that no one could put on a spectrum. And the, the winners, you know, the, the, the thing that pushed it over the top were a group of people called Urban Greens. They were completely excluded from all agricultural decision making, but we were able to create a process in which they came in, and we ended up with left, right, middle, we had conservatives, liberals, all kinds of people pushing for organic against the order system, which was the agricultural interest, the uh, uh, and just as, a, just as an aside on a professional tool, one of the things that happened was we, could, we would never have won in the Agriculture Committee on that, on that bill. We would have lost. It would have been a clear, the interest win. But we were able to get the chairman of the committee to say he would report the bill out without a vote. You just set it up onto the floor, and if you can get the votes on the floor, fine. And we were able to create what I would call a matrix of support as opposed to um, a spec, you know, spectrum. But all of that stuff, the, 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 what it boils down to finally is uh, politics is personal, it's personal conversations. If you can create those personal conversations and create space for that, and they begin to move their way out, all that stuff about left, right, Democrat, Republican becomes background. And the foreground becomes, how do we solve this problem? It, it's interesting when you look at the healthcare is the greatest issue in the world lobby because Anytime you have a point that you make, you're putting it through a personal filter, and it's grandma, and it's Uncle Ed, and it's diabetes, and so everything is personal. I've been pregnant. I know, you know, everything, everything. It's not like when you go and talk about telephone rates, where people glaze out at you. And, and what you're saying is exactly right. I mean, I have seen things happen that should not have happened when I have 150 NDs walking the halls of Congress, 600 people coming to a reception with all natural and whole foods that five years ago they would have known what the heck we were about. The question is, is how do you sustain that and so that you can make that consistent change that's required over time to get these things done? Because as we, it, it, we're going to learn a really poor lesson if this bill actually passes because there's nothing else that passes this quickly in Congress, trust me. Um, <laughs> So unless it's a censure bill for somebody yelling you lie, but uh, you know, other than that, everything takes a long time. And, and what I've discovered is, is we we like to think those of us who work these issues that we're separate and apart from everyone. But the reality is, is that most of the members of Congress take supplements. They're all taking vitamins. I think it's up to Henry Waxman. I think he's the only one that's never taken a vitamin in his life. And subsequently, we have the audience. It's just that they, you know. Um, 
Grassley uses acupuncture, his wife uses acupuncture, the president has a chiropractor, President Bush had an acupuncturist in the White House all those years. His governor brother in Florida had a naturopathic doctor, and her, his daughter was being treated by an ND for drug abuse. These are stories we all know, but they're not, there's not enough cover in the world for the legislators to come out and say, yes, if you look at, um, with parity in mental health, I worked with, I was a lobbyist for the American Psychiatric Association. The only reason, I mean, back in the 80s when I worked for them, they'd been at it for 10, 15 years, it took them another 20. The only reason that they got those is because they had a champion on the hill whose daughter was schizophrenic. And you know, they were pouring research dollars into it over and over and over. So it's that, just that water dripping thing, you know? It's like that constant uh, being aware and being very clear on the messages, very, very open, very transparent. And, um, and, and doing what Jim says, which is not putting people in boxes, because it doesn't work anymore. Thank you. I'm trying to get a few more questions. Can we run past 3 o'clock a little bit, Lois? Um, okay. what, what I would suggest is maybe one more question, and then maybe the panelists can entertain additional questions, either here or out there. Sure. That's sure. I don't know whose hand was first, but... I think you've been trying for a while. <laughs> Trish Tech, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the public, very concerned. Public. I think with all these issues, we have such huge money coming in from all the lobbying groups that it's absolutely putting us at the disadvantage of getting anything accomplished that we need accomplished. Because you have the dairy people doing the dairy thing, plus the drug companies, and I am a former doctor's wife, and the drug companies who think they're quiet now, it's billions of dollars they're spending to get what they want, neglecting what the rest of us need. How do we combat the lobbyists? Because it's, it's frightening that as much as we can do individually, they've got billions of dollars to spend, and they spend it on our economy. That's the real question, isn't it? I mean, you know, you can't give up. Uh, we're creating Americans Living Life Well, which is going to be a 501c3. At its core, it will be a place where everyone can go and be an advocate and join us on, on a march in 2011 in May. If they can bring in tens of thousands of people to complain about whatever it was they were complaining about a week ago, I'm pretty confident we can get 100,000 people to come say, this is what we want. And, and so that effort is ongoing. And, and I think the other thing is, yes, we're outnumbered and we are outvoted and we are outfunded and it will be the people's voice that makes the difference at the end of the day and you just you just know that there are websites and people who do this all the time and it, if you guys want it you have to really act you know we can only do so much as people in washington dc and elect people that will listen so having your voice to it is a personal health care behavior it is but let me let me also say uh, uh, We've learned through the Obama campaign that um, the 12 and a half million people gave an average of $87 and created the largest political campaign war chest in history. The people have not actually been uh, drawn on to create the kinds of counter forces that are necessary. Um, I believe that that two thirds that's out there doesn't want to, doesn't, it's written these guys off. What we need to figure out is how can they participate in the process that we're talking about. And uh, the, the most, to me, the most important structural problem is that approximately 85% of the seats of Congress are pre predetermined which party they're going to be for by agreement. It's so gerrymandered that you, it doesn't matter who you really work for. It's going to be, that's got to be changed, and that's one of the places I think real energy can be put. But in the meantime, you, you uh, harness enough people behind an issue and you'll win. We, uh, we had to fight the entire establishment at Citizens for Health on dietary supplements and uh, sent two and a half million letters to Congress and got a bill passed that the FDA had proposed, FDA proposed a bill to restrict dietary supplements. Two and a half million people, so this is before the internet, sent uh, letters to Congress and that bill came out as a support for dietary supplements. And that's the kind of thing that can be done. And those two and a half million people, I don't even know if they were voters, but I can tell you, the Congress uh, members were sitting there saying, I don't want to vote against that. And I have two minutes to three, so you have a chance for your question. Very quick. Um, my name's Barbara Beaver. I'm from Fairfax. And I'm a healthcare consumer like everyone else here. Um, I come from a family of doctors. I myself am not in the medical field. I'm concerned about the um, 
I have nieces and nephews who are in medical school, and I'm concerned about the kind of education that they're getting in medical schools now. Um, is it the traditional, you know, doctor treat the disease, or, or are there some programs that are talking about alternative medicines in medical schools? Um, as an adjunct to that, um, I'm 55 years old and I'm trying to take responsibility now for my own health care and looking for an alternative to the traditional doctor that every time I go in she gives me another pill and you know now I'm up to seven different pills a day and I don't want to do that for the next three or four years and I've been at it so long. So I think in answer to your question, yes, there is a, a big movement and it is a very important point of entry into the systems that you're talking about is education. Education at every level. We heard earlier about the uh, elementary schools and, and high schools and college here, but certainly medical school education. And it's an area called integrative medicine. The idea is not to uh, marginalize these kinds of approaches as alternative. Alternative implies that you're going to throw out the huge advances in, in you know, space age medicine that we have and we're going to go to some alternative planet. Um, there's also, it's complementary and alternative, moves it more towards the mainstream. But the, but the term now that's being uh, used is integrative medicine, to integrate all of these approaches, holistic approaches that take into account the entire body and the entire spirit and the emotions um, and into health. And again, focus that, that definition of the World Health Organization of health being more than the absence of disease is very, very true. I, I think it's interesting that, um, I don't know how many of you read the Washington Post, but every article that deals with the current health care debate, there's a little logo on it which is two pills. Have you noticed that? It struck me that that clearly in our society um, the, the, the reason they picked that logo must be because when we see two pills, we think of, ah, health care. So you're running shoes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so Check out the that's advertising. Right, that's right. Right. <laughs> but, so, so, there, that's right. So there is a, a, a big movement. There's now, I think, over, close to 50 medical schools, over 35 for sure, uh, involved in this integrative medicine training programs. Um, so you can look that up on the web. There's, uh, I believe, pardon me, the captain is the, the acronym, consortium is the academic, and then the Correct. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and there's certainly here, there's in, in, in Maryland, and uh, you know, you can, you can check out local areas, but there, uh, you can get integrative care, and there is integrative medicine training, and more and more so. And also, I, I would just like to add that uh, in the, uh, the holistic uh, healthcare system, uh, MDs have been very involved right across the board. I mean, MD acupuncturists were really crucial in getting acupuncture adopted, but, and so they're there. And you know, a, a reflection of that is that right now, fewer than 20% of the MDs in the United States belong to the AMA, which is important to know. So here's my plug for my, my website, www.natureopathic.org. We have about 80,000 people a month who hit our website looking for naturopathic doctors, and so we have a, a search function there, and you can find out. Because not all states are licensed, including Virginia, you can find out who's credentialed to provide this care. Actually, if you look up my website, I do have a, a listing of integrative uh, health centers, so it's www.estersternberg.com. Okay, we have a question. Okay, I have a request being that we're at a university for the dissemination of ideas and information. Is there going to be a synopsis of this for me who is too lazy to write down all these websites that <laughs> you each have a blurb perhaps in there and the websites that you recommended and the sources? Is there anything like that to be we'll, compiled for now? We had not thought of that, but we will see if we can't do that. We are taping so that that will be a, a, a stream of our website students. Um, Infocct.gmu.edu. I'm looking at the <laughs> The website is cct.gmu.edu. No www. We will have. And they will have the ability to put their little board in there for everything that they said. We, we will see what we can do in the next couple of 
a great idea. And I appreciate everyone coming and let's hear from you. Thank you very much.